Hey, Hello. How are you? Good. How is my audio and such? It's fine. It's good. Can you hear me okay too? Yep. I'm just using my computer speakers because I have a microphone that I use for um, for our podcast, but you have to be like right up at it for it to, you know, do very good. So um, we're just going to try it on the computer this time and see how it does. My husband's going to join us. I think he's using the bathroom. <laughs> so what's up? I don't know with if it's the... my intro. We'll go ahead. Say, I don't know if it's my internet or your internet that's you're cutting out a little on my end. Okay, let me move. But if I phone. sound good to you, well, no, if I'm not cutting out on your end, the recording's going to be fine. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, you're. So doing... don't worry about it. Okay, I am going to move it though because sometimes it does better if I move it to the window. So let me grab it real quick. <laughs> you ready that's okay so what's up with all the power outages they are just have to do some maintenance on like fixing things yeah so for safety they have to turn it off this is my husband hello i've hello. seen you on social media yeah. <laughs> hello <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, you ready to talk about cows? Oh yeah, <laughs> always. Okay. Time for cows. Yeah, it's cow I'm, time. It's cow time. All right, I'm gonna just um, introduce the podcast, and then we're just gonna talk. I'm not like I have just a few questions, just in case I, you know, go blank or whatever. But I think this will be a pretty natural conversation. Um, so we love our cows. We love our cows. Yes. At some point, my baby's going to start waking up. So I will just have to text my mother-in-law. So she'll send because he's sleeping in here. But oh, yeah, that's fine. Not a problem. All right. Well, um, welcome back to the podcast. We are here today with my friend Kate from Venison for Dinner. And um, I got to know Kate um, just a few months ago, but um, I, I enjoy her a lot. She has just an honesty and um, just a lot of quality I don't, she's, she's giving me the eyes now um, just a lot of qualities that um, frankly are missing in the you know the internet like the social media web so um, I think that the fact that she is just so real and um, and just very honest about everything that she puts out there uh, just makes her very likable for people. So um, I'm excited to have you on, Kate. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Um, so we are going through a series on the homesteading animals. And um, we talked to Rose, our friend Rose um, from Wholesome Roots a few weeks ago about goats. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about cows because she milks her goats. We talked a little bit about cows on that episode um but we're a little partial to the milk cow mm -hmm. so um yeah it was a it was a goat show we, we moved to cows quickly didn't we? <laughs> yeah we did the same yeah <laughs> yeah so we um we do love our milk cows and that's one thing that i learned about kate really quickly is that she is all about the family milk cow so um kate do you want to just kind of introduce yourself a little bit and tell us you know what you do and all about you and why you love the family milk cow so much sure so i'm kate i live in northern british columbia canada with my husband and our five kids if you know me you know it's not a surprise that i'm here to talk about milk cows today because we are very passionate about our milk cows we have jerseys we also have pigs and chickens cats dogs the whole old McDonald type farm. And we got into milk cows 13 years ago, I guess. And at that point, we didn't know that they were, that raw milk was a controversial thing. Mm. We just thought it was farm fresh milk. We didn't know it was illegal. We didn't try to sell it or anything. We just, where we live, raw milk is illegal across the board. So if you want to have raw milk, you have to have your own cow no herd shares, nothing. Mm. 
And it wasn't until we had someone come over, they're like, you have a milk cow? Can I get milk from you? And we're like, it's just milk. Like we didn't realize it was this whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> and as someone who's always had troubles with dairy, stomach aches, um, head congestion, sinus headaches from dairy, it was really amazing to discover that I could consume all the lovely dairy I wanted if it wasn't pasteurized. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Isn't and it? it's quite, it's really quite something how that process changes it so much. And multiple of my kids are the same way too. And we just kind of got hooked on cows. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to do. I know we, a few months ago, I think you were like, wait a minute, I didn't even know you had a milk cow. And I'm like, yeah, we have three. <laughs> we're getting, or we're getting more. I think is when we, when we discovered, um, or you discovered that we had milk cows, but we've been milking go outside baby <laughs> we're, we're gonna have children running in too so um but yeah, yeah. And if you hear something it's my husband with a drill or okay. an impact driver in the room below me because he's building canning shelves and he's on a roll and I'm not gonna stop him I That's want right. those shelves yeah. yeah don't stop that process <laughs> um but yeah we've milked um or I say we but mostly Adam I have had milked before, but mm -hmm. he's the regular milker around here. And um, so how long have we milked Betty? Like, is this the third this year? Third year. Yeah, third year yeah. that we've had a milk cow. Um, and then just this past spring, we added two more. Mm -hmm. And we feel like we probably should add more. Yeah. Um, just yeah, because demand sure. just because we do we are able to do the herd share thing here in North Carolina and um and we have a waiting list and mm -hmm. I mean that's really why we got two additional cows was because we had a, such a big waiting list and now we've filled that one and we have mm -hmm. you know some more that have just joined the waiting list so um it's a thing people are people are starting to you know wake up to the fact that the um the pasteurized milk that they are getting at the store has has really done more harm than good mm -hmm. and and that um that the raw milk is, I mean, like you said, we're just able to consume that so much easier um, or digest that so much easier. So what's interesting about the digestion standpoint is it's actually not just the pasteurization, it's the homogenization. Mm. So my understanding, this is like a very layman's, mm -hmm. That's fine. you know, explanation is that the milk is shot through a hose at high pressure and it's shot at some sort of like disc or background of some sort that it busts up the cream globules mm -hmm. so that they don't come back together mm -hmm. so that the cream doesn't rise to the top mm -hmm. but in this process it then in the way that gluten coats a celiac's hairs in their intestines the cream can do the same thing to people who are sensitive to dairy mm -hmm. their body can't figure out how to separate that cream again from the milk to digest it properly and so they end up with stomach aches and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. Huh. I was wondering why. I knew it was something. I just assumed it was the good bacteria that was killed in the pasteurization process. That as well, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting about that is, the homogenization. Yeah. The homogenized. Yeah. But even just, um, we have lots of dairy farmer friends and their milk all goes into a bulk tank and there's an agitator in the bulk tank and everything. And they're allowed to draw milk from it for themselves. And they said they don't get anywhere the type of cream lines we get, even if they're feeding the exact same things, because the agitator's constant agitation of the milk the cream just doesn't rise in the same way. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. literally the farm we buy jerseys from, they said they will never get a cream line like we do on our jars. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, well, it turns the butter so fast. I'm sure a lot gets stuck, <laughs> stuck in there. Um, you said you have jerseys. You have all, how many cows do you have right now? We have three Jersey cows, okay. which was an unintentional <laughs> thing because we, we had our one Jersey and we kind of were thinking about getting a second one. And then we were offered a heifer for a song. So we got her because she's a three-quartered cow. She lost one before they have their first calf. Other 
if ever other heifers nurse on them, it can introduce bacteria. They can get mm-hmm. mastitis before they've even produced milk. And that infection, you pretty much can never catch it soon enough. Mm-hmm. Even though we treated it and everything, um, that quarter doesn't produce milk. Mm-hmm. So she only produces on three quarters, which for a dairy farmer with machine milker is really annoying. Yeah. 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 I can see that. And actually the rhythm of hand milking is, is odd with three quarters. Yeah, mm-hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't flow well. Right. So then when the older milk cow calved this year, she had a whole lot of problems kind of pretty much was on death's door for a couple of weeks mm-hmm. and she had so many antibiotics. We were like, we don't even know at what point we'll feel comfortable consuming her milk if she lives. Mm-hmm. So we decided to buy another cow. And that cow on death's door is still alive and producing four to five gallons of milk a day. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah. And I, when I asked, so to, that's how you make your cow live. If you yeah. buy another one. Buy another one. <laughs> I know when I, um, uh, when I first asked you to be on the podcast to talk about the milk cow, it's been, it's been a couple months ago that we were first talking about it. And it was like right there when you were starting to go through the whole like thing with your, with your cow being sick and everything. And I was like, oh no, this is like real raw for her. I'm not sure she's going to want to talk about the milk cow. And then like, she's doing great. So yeah. it was tough. It's yeah. tough on any animal sick, but I'm, I can imagine the milk, milk cow. cow. We haven't had we, experienced that yet, but. Yeah. So to summarize, Jessa is our first calf heifer. She's feeding two calves right now. We don't milk her. Mossy is our older cow who had all the issues. We're milking her twice a day. And then Clover is our newer cow and we're milking her twice a day as well. (laughs) Wow. Mm. So how much milk do you get total every day? Eight to 10 gallons. (laughs) (laughs) So what, um, if you're not really selling it, what are you it's okay um what are you doing what do you do the most with your milk do you make cheese or what so one way we somewhat get around which some people would debate whether it is legal or not is that we have people who milk for us Mm -hmm. i'm just gonna close that there we have people who milk for us and take the milk so they do the whole process milk Mm -hmm. the cow take the milk some people say that still the milk isn't supposed to leave your property Um, These people don't pay us for the milk in any way. Mm -hmm. Um, I literally give it to them. Um, My sister will like buy medications for the cow, like vaccinations. She'll buy like if there's a special feed supplement that I'm wanting or something. She does that sort of thing to help with the cost of the cows. But there is zero transaction to do with Mm -hmm. um, selling the milk. Okay. Yeah. So that's about four times a week that that happens. So that leaves us with five days a week of milk. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of skim milk goes to the pigs and chickens, but I make all our own cheese. We don't buy any dairy, uh, butter, ice cream, sour cream, cheese. I make it all. And I think it surprises people how much fluid milk it takes to produce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It takes a lot. I mean, it gets going once you start making stuff, especially cheese. I could see it. Yeah. You know, gallons of milk being used up in cheese making. Right. Right. And even it separating is. it. I mean, it, t- it takes a while, but it takes a ton of milk to get what little bit of cream we get. Mm-hmm. You know, we yeah. did, how much did we do? 30 gallons this week and we got a gallon of cream or something? Yeah, it was. Or less than a gallon of cream? Yeah, I don't think it was that many gallons. From 30 gallons of milk? It was 20 something. Yeah, I don't think it was that much. I don't remember. Anyway, do you calf share? No, no, we don't. That is not much cream going on there. Yeah, we made really thick cream. Yeah, right? our our separator has the adjustment uh, okay. is where you take it apart, and so we played around with that, and we decided we wanted thicker cream this time. So we did. Uh, we didn't get as much, but it is thicker. It is really thick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't have a separator. I've debated that, but I just sometimes feel like it's another dish to wash. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I don't want to warm up milk to do it. I'd want to do it with fresh milk. Yeah. Yeah. And I skimmed this morning a three gallon bucket of milk, three and a half gallon bucket of milk, probably. And I got a half gallon of kind of 
heavy to light cream. Like I skim till I see milk. So there is some light cream and some heavy cream in there. And that will give me just over a pound of butter. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah. Do you make uh, like designs on your butter? (laughs) No, I make my butter. I did. Can you hear the baby in the background? Yeah, but yeah, he's fine. I just hollered for someone to (laughs) come get him. Um, I make butter and then I weigh it into four ounce blocks. And then I just squish it into a rough rectangle with my hands Mm -hmm. and put it on a plate in the freezer. Yeah. Okay. Everybody that I talk to, especially at the farmer's market, when they talk about their grandparents or whoever making butter, it was always, you know, they had this special way of doing it and they always made this pretty little thing. Yeah. They had the nice mold Mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. I don't, I I don't have a butter mold. Um, I've never used one, Mm -hmm. but yeah, that's a, that's my experience too. People come here and they're just like, do you put designs on your, I'm like, no, we just eat it. (laughs) I have one, but it just has stripes in the top and it's Uh kind of like summer thicker, summer thinner. Yeah. And it's pretty, but it's another dish to wash. Yeah, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's true. And it needs to be cold ideally. So like you almost need to store it in the freezer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it doesn't, it, it does best with kind of eight or 16 ounce blocks. Mm-hmm. And I really like four ounce blocks. Mm-hmm. Oh, someone's coming for Amos now. <laughs> so what, um, so like, I think a lot of people that are listening to this um, homesteading series are super new to homesteading. Maybe, maybe haven't um bought any animals yet or just like dipping their toes into it um and i think i mean i think a milk cow i mean we talk about all the time how the milk cow is the you know the most important animal on our farm really and um and i think though that if you're just starting out that can be pretty intimidating you know to first of all to find one I mean we had to we went to another state to get our Mm -hmm. last two that we bought um that we were comfortable buying because you can I mean I know you've experienced this too like you can find milk cows from from dairies or whatever um but you're not you're not super comfortable with the Mm -hmm. way they've been raised and fed and and all the things so just finding those perfect cows can be intimidating enough, but also just like, you know, just how it ties you down Mm -hmm. too. like just the constant, like you can't just say, okay, I'm just don't feel like milking today. Like it's just something, it's a commitment, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, So, I mean, someone just starting out, would you be like, maybe you should start with a smaller animal, like a, like a milk goat, if you're wanting milk as your, I mean, this is like your goal. Um, Or would you say, just go ahead and, and, and try the milk cow. We're unique in that we had a milk cow before we had any other livestock and before we even had kids. Okay. Yeah. We were dating and we had a milk cow. <laughs> <laughs> we were given it. Oh, wow. We had friends who had bought this milk cow and they'd had it for a year and a half and they were tired of milking and being tied down. They liked to travel more than they thought they did. And Uh, when we'd been at their place, Marius had just loved drinking the milk. He grew up on farm milk and all that. And they called and they said, we're tired of milking. Would you like this cow? We'll give it to you. Yeah. (laughs) And she wasn't producing a lot of milk at that point, only about a gallon a day. But even at that, we didn't know how to make anything. And a gallon a day adds up really fast when you don't know how to make anything. Mm -hmm. We dried her up soon after she, we probably milked her for a few months and then we dried her up and it took a while to get her bread back and everything. So it was a year and a half probably before we were milking her again and then into a lot of milk. Mm -hmm. I think goats, if you really, really have a small space and a small budget, get the very best goat you can Mm -hmm. look at genetics because genetics play such a huge part in goats. You can get goats who give a gallon of milk a day, and then you get goats who give you a pint of milk a day. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, 
it's just not worth your time. It's, it takes almost as long to milk a goat as it does a cow. Yeah. But you're getting a fraction of the milk. That's true. Mm-hmm. So if you have the space and you have the money, because cows cost a lot more, mm-hmm. I'd say go for the cow. Yeah. I don't know. There's a certain level of you're only going to learn it by doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would agree. And that's when we talked to Rose about goats, like that was really her. I mean, that was her answer too, was like, you know, you need to get what you intend on, on yeah. using. Like if you're wanting to work up to a milk cow, like just go ahead and get the cow, you mm-hmm. know, like just, just kind of jump into it. And yeah. um, what would you say is like the, the thing that you need to be the most watchful for about cows. Um, I know we haven't had a sick cow yet, um, thankfully, but I know that day is coming. Um, Mm -hmm. So what's, what is like your best piece of advice? Like, what do you need to look for um, to make sure that they're healthy and happy and all? So I'd say there's kind of two different parts here. There's calving and there's just regular daily life. And I think The good thing about milk cows in regular daily life is because you spend so much time with them, you get more in tune with them and it's easier to tell when they're off. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know that a chicken isn't feeling well, or, you know, that we have something wrong with our chickens until chickens start dying. Yeah. Right. I'm not (laughs) as in tune with them. We recently just lost a bunch of chickens. Yeah. And it took us a few days to figure out what was even going on. And it was just a stress thing, actually. Mm -hmm. They had an issue with their waterer and we didn't realize it, even though they were getting fresh water. It was just, anyways, it was a whole thing. We lost some chickens, cows. I can tell they don't want to eat their grain. They're slow to come in for milking. Their milk production goes down. There's all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I'd say the most critical thing that you should know with a milk cow is where their rumen is and what it should look like normally versus what they look like if they're bloated. Because even if you have a grass fed cow who doesn't get any grain, they can bloat on clover. They can bloat on alfalfa. They can bloat on just forage. Mm -hmm. So our kids know this and our kids, uh, we have friends with milk cows. And it was one of the first things our kids went and taught their kids too, was where's their rumen. And it's, and just something for them to keep an eye on. And so if you're looking at a cow from the back, right is their runt. So right is their calf left lunch is how we remember it. And then at the back of their rib cage, where it kind of, there's the rib cage and then the spine and then their hip and it forms a triangle. So we call that the room and triangle. And it should be not flush with the rest of her body, usually a little in, if you Mm -hmm. feel it, it feels like firm, like a stress ball type firm. If you look at it and it looks more rounded, if you knock on it and it sounds like a basketball, there's gas in her rumen and you need to deal with that before it gets more serious and she goes down. Mm -hmm. Well, go ahead. Where are you getting ready to say? Um, Well, I was just thinking, do we talk about then what do you do if they, (laughs) if we notice a cow is bloated, first I want to figure out why why are they bloating Mm -hmm. did they get out and get into grain did you decide to double what grain you were feeding them in one milking in one feeding and you know their rumen just couldn't handle it or was there something in their pasture it can even be something in the hay at times Mm -hmm. and then we have something called bloaties you can also use just an inexpensive cooking oil we have a jug of it in the basement because I don't want to use my expensive olive oil to Mm -hmm. tube a cow. (laughs) And you basically are just wanting to get it into their throat. Our bloaties has a long neck on the bottle. So you can just use the bottle. We put them in the milking stanchion. We hold their nose up and we put it behind their back teeth and just kind of get them to swallow it. And it cuts the bubbles in the foam and it helps the gas pass through. You can also, we usually then take that same bloaties bottle and fill it up with the cheap cooking oil, like sunflower oil, and get that down their throat because the oil also cuts the bubbles and the foam and helps things through. And if you didn't have bloaties, you could just do more cooking oil, but it's inexpensive. You get it at the feed store and it's just one of those things. 
that's easy to just have in the cupboard mm -hmm. and it's cheap insurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. I don't think we've ever dealt with that. Mm -mm. Never, never had bloat mm -mm. that I remember. Not yet. <laughs> one cow, I mean, we did have one cow that got down to, um, she just calved and it was, uh, what is that? It's a calcium deficiency. Milk fever. Yes, mm -hmm. milk fever. Yep. Yeah. We did have that once. Yeah. That wasn't a milk cow, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, milk fever is another one that even if you don't know how to treat for it, you should have the supplies on hand if you have a cow calving, because it's better to be Googling, YouTubing at one in the morning, how yeah. to IV a cow yeah. versus just watching there at one in the morning while your cow dies because you can't right. get a hold of a vet and nobody can come. Mm -hmm. And I joked and said that. And then a friend of mine, a few weeks later, found herself at two in the morning looking on YouTube, how was she going to IV this cow? But she had all the supplies on hand. Yeah. So it, you know, it was not fun, but she saved her cow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're not expensive things. They're not like, at least for us, I bet you it's probably under $60 to have the milk fever supplies on hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at the cost of a cow, that's just cheap insurance to have that in your cupboard. I don't think it expires. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. That's one thing I'm finding out is having medical supplies for the animals mm -hmm. just, just here, you know, mm -hmm. you know, we usually find out the hard way a yeah. lot of times, you know, because we don't know, or we haven't experienced it, mm -hmm. but once we do, then now we know, and now we get those things and we keep them and we know what to do, or we can at least look it up. You know? <laughs> yeah. We had, we had a vet out for the very first time in you know mm -hmm. a decade of doing this yeah. and um this week or last week and you know after he was looking at our it was our ram that was not doing well and after he you know was instructing about what to do and he he did his thing adam was like i could have done that like i just didn't mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. and so just having those supplies those same things he was using and and stuff that we can we can yeah. get then yeah then we'll know better next time so but. And depending on where you are and depending on how, like there's, there's rules with antibiotics and medications and some vets are so incredibly stickler and some are a little looser in how they interpret the rules. Um, so some won't just sell you a bottle of penicillin. They'll be like, well, what's your cow and what's its size? And I'm going to sell you only that dose. Yeah. Um, we're fortunate our vet will just prescribe us the whole bottle sell us the whole bottle yeah so in an event of an emergency we do have that sort of thing on hand and we also live in an area with a lot of family farms that so the average dairy around here is probably 100 cows or less we don't have big dairies but we probably have 10 to 15 dairies and so they're all just really down to earth people who, you know, are in the trenches alongside of you, who aren't afraid to take your call and answer your questions and admit when they don't know what you should do either. And we also have beef farmers and they all have their own stock and of medications and that sort of thing. And, you know, when I had all those issues with Mossy, I talked to multiple farmers and pretty much everyone was willing to just, you know, grab what they have and come over to help because the vet is so expensive to get out. It costs $300 yeah. just for the call. Oh, wow. And then whatever they do on top of that. Goodness. Wow. Mm. So they say themselves, even like the vet says, don't get us out there unless you know, you it's an animal that's really worth your money to save. Right. Oh, wow. Right. Wow. Mm. That's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Um, going back to like the the like what you do with all your milk um i know you have a membership group which i want you to like talk about that in a minute but um so you make a lot of cheese and things like that is do you have a favorite cheese that you make because we need to do i mean we don't have a lot of milk to use anymore because we have so many in our herd share but um but i would love to to experiment more with cheese making because we eat a lot of cheese in our house. So 
I have a big passion towards getting people making cheese because I was that person who had all this milk, but was so overwhelmed by cheese making and aging cheese that I just never even started. Mm -hmm. So once I figured out how to make cheese, how to make it while homeschooling, how to age it in my normal fridge, all these things, I don't need specialty fridges. I don't need to set aside, you know, a whole afternoon that all I'm doing is cheese making. I actually think cheese making and homeschooling pairs really well because there's times when I need to be around to answer questions or maybe go help them for a minute, but I don't need to be sitting beside them. And if I'm sitting beside them, I'm bored out of my skull. Like, okay, just come on, get done here, get done here. So when I have something like cheese to make or butter to make, I can be puttering on that while helping them. And my recipes are all really flexible in my membership. It covers a lot more than just cheese making, but there is full tutorials for Gouda, Asiago and Butterkäs. So Butterkäs is a German butter cheese. If you like cheeses that aren't really strong tasting, um, cause that's the other thing is a lot of homemade cheeses are really strong tasting. And that's not something I go for because the average person and the average child does not want a strong tasting cheese. Mm-hmm. So Butterkäs is the most mild and it only ages for a month. And then Gouda is a classic. I'm married to a Dutchman. My last name is Shat. (laughs) And I had to perfect the Gouda. So we make, most of the Gouda we make has cumin seeds in it, which they call spiced Gouda. And that is like a classic here. Like Mm. when we have people over and I serve spiced Gouda, that is, you know, that's the (laughs) ticket. And then Asiago is not a cheese I even had till I was probably 25 years old that it's kind of a cross between a Parmesan and a cheddar. Mm. Have you had Asiago before? Yeah, I think so. Mm. Like uh, on like a salad or something before, Mm. like shaved on salad, but I've never made, tried to make it or anything like that. But so Asiago, I think is one of the first cheeses you should try making for a few reasons. It's really versatile. We will have it in our Caesar salad in place of Parmesan or you can put it on a burger or you can have it with crackers and cheese or you can make a grilled cheese sandwich with it. It's very versatile and it uses a partial fat milk. So you can steal some of the cream and kind of just leave yourself with about an inch of cream, not even the heaviest cream. Mm -hmm. The process isn't complicated. It's really straightforward. And then you just vacuum seal it and throw it in the fridge. Okay. So that's a fun one to make. The Gouda and the Buder case um, they taste better faster. Like they only age for four to six weeks. Whereas Asiago you can eat after a month, but I think it does better with a few months. Okay. Mm. Okay. That's good to know. So is it, you're aging it in vacuum packaging? Is that how that's done? Yeah. So I just do it in vacuum sealing in vacuum seal bags, because then I don't have to control humidity in the fridge. I see. And Ideally, cheese ages, I think, at about 10 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but I age it in my milk fridge, which is very cold, like freeze lettuce cold. Yeah. I age it just fine. Maybe it takes another week or two. Like it's not a big deal and it's not worth overthinking it. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, what else is interesting is how people who will never drink raw milk will usually always, you know, eat cheese or ice cream or you know, butter, things like that. I, I think oh, that- yes. <laughs> we have someone like that in our family that when she comes over, she won't put milk in her tea or coffee or anything, but she's over there slathering the butter on her buns yeah. and, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, piling the cheese on her burger. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. bite my tongue. And like, if you're really looking at safety here, your best bet is the fresh raw milk not yeah. the aged cheese right uh-huh. yeah <laughs> right it's interesting it is yeah um so Do you guys get many people who have you know talk about you know like oh you drink raw milk how dangerous not really uh, occasionally occasionally we've gotten, but not really yeah we have a few i mean i've had a few people say i'm really curious about the milk yeah but i'm kind of nervous about it yeah you know and we had one customer that that we didn't explain well enough <laughs> about the cream or something and it, he said it made him sick <laughs> i think good. i told kate <laughs> about that yeah he said it made him sick and i'm pretty sure 
okay so anyways that's a long story but he he was already sick anyways because he had COVID <laughs> and then he was telling us that he thought that the milk made him sick but I think it was because he he said it was bad it's because the cream was on top I'm pretty yeah. sure like he he just didn't understand like what raw milk and he probably was. just drank like a glass of the cream on top cream. and then yeah. got a stomach ache and then because yeah. he'd never had raw milk probably got the shoots and <laughs> you know yeah it was- I have I have a friend here with a milk cow and she doesn't make cheese but she makes a lot of butter and she had skimmed off two gallons of cream and she had it in the fridge and her husband looked at it and it was so thick on top. He thought it had gone bad and he dumped it. Oh, oh my goodness. that's so oh. disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, did you cry? She said, I was too tired to cry. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh. Mm. Mm-hmm. that's a bad day. Yeah. We've had some milk accidents in our house when we were separating cream and stuff. Yeah. We've had like the entire kitchen floor is covered in milk. Yeah. Like it, it was awful. Like, but we're you know, we learn from those and do things differently. But um, so how do you, I know you said you read a lot. Do you have certain like resources, books or anything that you um, would recommend to people that want to like learn more about the milk cow before they get one or as they're, you know, in the process of getting one? I've actually never really read a book on milk cows. Okay. (laughs) There's the book, Keeping a Family Cow. Yeah. The people rave about. I've never had that book. (laughs) There is a book. I can't even remember. It's by Dirk Van Loon. I think it's just called The Family Cow. Really old book. Mm -hmm. And it's not super in-depth about milk cow stuff, but it was interesting enough to me. He also wrote one about pigs that I really love. Mm. Really old book. Yeah. Our first milk cow, we had a vet who was a good friend of my grandpa and he used to be an only dairy vet before he moved back to our little island where he had grown up and was just a general practice vet. Mm -hmm. So he had so much dairy knowledge and I just learned all from him and the vet call was so cheap that he would come out regularly to do things and he was just so generous with his knowledge and I learned so much from him mm. that's, that's nice yeah, yeah that is good the best to have, way to learn have somebody like that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's so hard especially with dairy. Yeah. at least here because I, I think we have the only dairy in the county or something you know it's yeah kind of, nobody around here has milk cows or has any interest in having a milk cow i mean there used to be dairies everywhere mm-hmm. and my, all of my family had a dairy all around here a long time ago but yeah we're struggling we're we are going out of town in a few weeks or a couple months and uh we're struggling to figure out how who's gonna take care of our milk cows like we have all like hundreds of animals right now but we we are worried about those milk cows like who's gonna do this so yeah (laughs) so our thing is that we know all these dairy farmers but none of them can hand milk okay Mm. and i do have the bucket and pulsator and claws but i don't have the pump for Mm. a milking machine and it's really expensive so we have to kind of make our own customized one where you like piece together some different things and it's just not really my wheelhouse in learning that and it's not really my husband's either so we've been trying to convince a couple people to help us and they don't move on the same timeline as we do and yeah Mm. yeah i'm not looking for a freebie i just need some yeah you know some guidance yeah yeah Adam was hand milking for a while two two yeah yeah, two whole years yeah and um and then when we got these new cows we um we actually bought their um milking machine from them Mm -hmm. that we got the cows (laughs) from uh because they were upgrading to a, a different one and um and we we like it we like it so far I mean I miss hand milk and it's not as um you're not as in in tune with the cow with the machine it's more production and you know yeah. let's get those done kind of thing right you know? um but i i mean i can milk three cows in the same amount of time i was milking one by hand so that part is really nice yeah we um were thinking about using the machine milker for daily milking 
Yeah. Because it was taking me an hour twice a day by the time, you know, you put your shoes on, you get your boots, you wash the cows up, you milk one cow, you wash the cow, you milk the other cow, deal with the milk, milk in the fridge, wash the bucket, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But my oldest, he just turned 12 two days ago. And he actually can now milk one out on his own mm. as of the last few weeks. Yeah. So now it's kind of just become one of his mandatory chores that he has to come milk with me. And he milks our older cow and I milk the other one because she has kind of firmer teats that yeah. take, are a little harder to milk. And that cut 20 minutes off of my milking yeah. chore time. That's nice. And that that's been really helpful. And even he goes out before me, he goes and gets the cows in while I'm dealing with buckets and getting that stuff. And then I just take the milk and go inside. He lets them out, feeds them grain, all that. And I actually think it's almost halved my milking time. Like it's so fast now to milk that there's two of us. We still need to get the milking machine going because then we could go away because almost every dairy farmer we know, yeah. you know, they've got a kid, they've got someone who can come mm -hmm. milk. Yeah. yeah but it's just the hand milking that they don't do right mm -hmm. right yeah yeah um you haven't tried the machine yet have you? i haven't yeah. no you have only hand it's milk. different it takes some get used to you know, yeah hooking hooking it all up and make sure things are running right yeah see that almost intimidates me more mm -hmm. is like the machine than the hand, hand milking but mm -hmm. i guess if people are used to the machines and yeah. what's hard with a cow is they're so used to routine and mm -hmm. doing things a certain way and so if our machine fails like i don't know if we can hand milk, hand milk these cows yeah. i mean there's one cow i know we can't she was she, I, like i can't touch her once the machine's running oh, so if, mm. if something were to happen you know we'll be scrambling <laughs> tie her down i guess years ago we had a milking machine and it wasn't a very good one so it would have issues yeah and you can probably understand the panic because this cow did not, we had two cows at that point. One of them, we could hand milk the other one, not a chance. Yeah. And when that milk machine started having issues, you would, you could figure out getting the milking done. Like you, the pulsator, it was the ones on the surge bucket that flick back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like the leathers, I think they call it. So you would sit there and you would flick them back and forth in the right pulse yeah. to finish the cow out. <laughs> wow. And then you have till the next milking time to get it working properly again. Yeah. And the panic of your, your whole day is shot. You are yeah. panicking, <laughs> trying to get that machine going. You worry it. like, what if the power is out and we can't milk? Like that is the one thing about having cows dependent on a milking machine. Yeah. yeah. You, you stress about the milking machine not working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm, that Guernsey. She, I mean, I can't even touch her. Once, once I've cleaned her and hooked the machine up, like I can't. <laughs> Just leave her alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's pretty particular. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that was we did two cows with a milking machine for about eight or nine months, and then when it was having issues one day, we were like, "That's it. Yeah. We're done with this." And we sold the cow and the machine to someone who was willing to fix the machine. Yeah. yeah and put the time in to mm -hmm. figure it out mm -hmm. yeah because that's part i mean that's a huge part of the lifestyle that we have is just figuring out how to you know what's working what's not how to be more efficient and like you were talking about your son helping you with the milk and then just just cutting off 20 minutes of your time is like a huge thing and doesn't sound like a lot to a lot of yeah. people but when you're doing hours and hours of chores mm -hmm. and then when problems come up then you're having to spend hours and hours fixing problems then you know all those minutes add up and Definitely. yeah yeah um, yeah. And then you end up kind of dropping other balls because you're trying to figure out, you're trying to fix things and things that, or things that like kind of probably needed fixing and you just couldn't get to them. And then suddenly something blows up there and then that becomes urgent and you have to drop other things. And it kind of just becomes yeah. some days you just feel like you're putting out fires. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. Hey, would you recommend someone getting a, a heifer, not in milk and, and just getting used to having a cow for a while? rather than a cow in milk i guess um no <laughs> i would say if you have experience 
say you were in 4-H and you had a steer project, you trained cows, you were used to handling cows, or you're a horse person and you train horses and you're that sort of person, that would be the only type of people I would say, yes, get a heifer. Mm. Otherwise, if you're getting one cow and all you have is one cow and she's not bred, you have to figure out getting her bred. You have to figure out, are you AIing? Are you taking her to a bull? When is she even cycling? What does cycling even look like? What if she isn't cycling regularly? And then after she calves, there's a good chance she wants nothing to do with her baby because she's never seen one before and she's a heifer and she's a new mom and you got to help them. And then her teats are probably small too. And so then you're struggling to milk those. She doesn't want to be milked. You got to train her. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. Yeah. We train, we've had two heifers, one of them after a week of trying to milk, we left her with her calf until it could be weaned and then sold it because she broke my husband's hand. And I was about eight months pregnant. And he said, you're not going near that cow. And yeah, we sold her and she went on to be a great cow for someone else. She just didn't fit with us. Our heifer we have now, we got her as a bred heifer and we got her for so cheap that Like the guy was like, if you end up eating her, I'm not hurt. Like, Mm -hmm. it's fine. If it doesn't work out. She is the most innately calm cow there is. We Mm -hmm. brought her home as an unhandled heifer and threw a halter on her and tied her to a post to treat her for the mastitis infection. Wow. Like she's, we call her Jessa the magic cow. (laughs) But even at that, it took, I bet three months of milking her once a day we were calf sharing of every milking you're training yeah it wasn't enjoyable her teats were small it was hard to milk and every milking you're you know she kicks or she shifts and you have to you know move her leg back or you know give her a smack on the leg no keep it down no 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 and you're just the whole time and it wasn't fun yeah and my husband didn't milk for probably two months after she calved and he had every milking time. And when I come inside, he asks, how are the cows this morning? You know, how was milking? And every time I'd come in and I'd be like, I got it done. It yeah. was okay. Yeah. yeah, I got it done, whatever. Yeah. And he didn't fully understand it until he had to milk because I was too pregnant. And he was like, wow, you're right. It's not enjoyable. You yeah. just have to get it done. Right. Yeah. So if that was your first experience with a milk cow, it could really turn you off. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Cause you, I mean, most people would assume you want a younger animal to start with, but I feel like with a dairy cow, you really want an old cow to start with. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily one that's even been milked. I think with an older cow, they're just calmer and, you know, they just kind of go with the flow. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little here about what sort of cow you should shop for how about okay yeah that's Mm -hmm. good Mm -hmm. so I'd say if I were looking ideally I want like a either end of first lactation or second lactation cow so they got some milking under their belt but they're not old I want her to be bred back unless she has just calved as a second freshener Mm -hmm. a cow that's not bred back is often a red flag they could be selling her because they can't get her bred Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if you don't have a bull if you don't have ai access easily for artificial insemination do not buy an unbred cow Mm -hmm. if they are beyond three or four months calving and they haven't been bred i would say don't don't buy them yeah like just those are just red flags to me Mm -hmm. if someone hasn't bred them or if they say they've been with a bull but they haven't been preg checked yeah. You get them preg checked. Yeah. And if the people aren't willing to do a preg check or anything like that, there's another red flag. Um, I think bread and near the end of a lactation. So they're lower in milk production. So you can get used to milking with less milk mm-hmm. without the pressure of like, they're so high production. They're going to get mastitis easily, all that. Mm-hmm. So you ha- can milk them for a few months and then dry them off for calving and kind of have a couple months to reassess like, okay, I need to set my stanchion up separately. We really do need another fridge. Hey, let's figure out a cheese press. Like you have a couple months to reassess things before you're into milk again. Mm -hmm. 
And I posted a, some pictures on Instagram this morning, actually one of a side profile of our older cow. And she looks okay. She looks decent. And a lot of people, that's what they see. And they, that's what they see pictures of, of a cow. And she looks decent. But when you look from her from behind, she is skinny and in bad condition because she almost died. Mm. But if you were just buying a cow or driving a long way to look at a cow and all you saw was their side profile, you could end up going to see a cow that's a hot mess. Yeah. So you want to see all angles on a cow, ideally like a video or even just like a few pictures from behind, from the side. I want to see their feet. I want to see what their teats and their udder look like. You know, you don't want a hanging low udder. You don't want tiny teats unless you know you're machine milking. Yeah. And then the other thing I've been learning recently is about how body confirmation. There's some things that really are linked to longevity in a cow to do with the confirmation of their body. So one of them is that you actually want them to look like they swallowed a barrel, like their ribs are like they swallowed a barrel and you want their ribs ribs <laughs> to be really wide apart. Ideally you can fit a few fingers between at least the back few ribs. And what this is, is it gives them capacity, capacity to hold a lot of hay capacity to hold a lot of grass so that even if you like, no matter where you are on feeding grain or not, if they have the capacity to hold a lot of hay or grass, they're going to thrive a lot more versus a cow with a pinched skinny rib cage that just can't consume the same amount of feed. Yeah. So a cow that you can look at and be like, wow, that cow is actually looks skinny. It could be just because she's got a massive barrel to her but otherwise her covering on her hips and her back and everything is actually really good. Yeah. Yeah. So the ribs are actually not a good indicator on if a cow is in good shape or not yeah. is something I've learned recently. Okay. And another thing is their front end. A lot of cows have really pinched shoulders and then their knees almost end up a little knock kneed. So they also don't have the lung capacity and the chest capacity. And they're just really pinched in the front end. And my older cow, she has a skinny ribs and skinny shoulders with knock need. Mm -hmm. So when I was explaining this to my husband, like, these are some things I've learned recently, you know, you want a cow that has this and this and that. And he's like, so that's everything Mossy isn't <laughs> like, yeah, that's everything Mossy Aww. isn't. And this is why at five years old, she is crashing. Yeah. yeah. She just doesn't genetically have the robust constitution. Mm -hmm. So when I bought my last cow, I looked at it a totally different way. I told the farmer, I'm going to be really picky. He gave me a choice of a lot of cows. Um, we know them well. And they were like, you know what? We'll throw away the sale list for you. You find what you really want here and we'll make a deal. So I walked through their barn and first I wanted, he told me like which cow was like a heifer or first lactation, second lactation, that sort of thing. Cause I didn't want older cows. But with their numbering system, it was pretty easy to figure out which are older and which are younger cows. And I would look through and I'm like, okay, I like that udder. I like those teats. And then I'd like, look at the rest. Okay. What's their front end look like? What is their, you know, <laughs> what looked like? Are they bred? Whatever. And we went through and pulled a bunch of numbers and then went to their computer and looked at all their stats and everything. And then narrowed it down to the cow I ended up with. Okay. So it was a totally different way of shopping for a cow. Mm -hmm. And I was like super blessed to even be able to have that opportunity to just walk through a barn of a hundred milking cows and pick yeah. out what I want. Right. Yeah. Like there was only a few cows that they were like, no, you can't buy that cow. Mm -hmm. So that was just a really, you know, in a really hard time with our other cow, I was just super blessed to have had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's but just I think if you have a cow that maybe has some things that you don't love about it, that's when it's important to pay attention to the bull statistics yeah. to try and correct it there. Mm. And that was something I had never looked at too hard before. I was mostly just looking at like teat length and um, butter fat and that sort of thing on the bull statistics. So yeah. now I'm starting to pay attention to things like their front end and their rib cage and that sort of thing to balance out my other cows. Mm -hmm. Hey, do you know if a cow can be overweight? Do you know if they're overweight, do they have a hard time breeding back? Have you ever heard that? 
in my experience, yes. Okay. I had it happen with two cows. One, we just waited way too long after calving to try breeding her back. And we could just never get her bred back after that. Um, after three or four tries with our vet, our vet told her to just eat at her. They were like, you don't have access to a bull. We lived on a small island. There was no bull that we could use. And he said, at this point, you can eat her and come out even. But if we keep trying, you're going to get a lot more expensive here. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other cow I had, um, she was bred via AI and she never cycled again. So we were like, oh, great. She's pregnant. Mm -hmm. And then we go to dry her off at seven months pregnant. And we're like, you know what? She doesn't really look like she's getting too big here. Mm -hmm. So we got the vet out and she had cysts on her ovaries, which can be something they get from being a little overweight hmm. because a dairy cow will put on fat internally before they will put it on externally. So you won't see that they're getting really fat, but they are. And then they have a hard time breeding back. Hmm. And it also can cause troubles with calving in terms of they can end up with displaced stomachs if they're overweight, which we learned recently too because we were trying to rule out uh, left displaced abomasum and LDA. And one of the things was if your cow is on the fat side, after calving, their stomach can have a hard time getting back in the right place. Mm -hmm. Or the calf can't turn properly. And then you have troubles with calving. Mm -hmm. That was terrible, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> it does sound they got to get pretty fat for that to happen. Yeah. 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 I just heard that. And it just seems kind of, it didn't seem right for mm. a cow to be overweight and cause problems. Mm. It is, cow, unfortunately. A yeah, cow should be hefty, you know. Yeah. Like you said, it, sh it should have a barrel. Yeah. Stomach. Yeah. Yeah. It's not about the barrel, though. It's about the other parts of their body that are. Yeah. Yeah. And the one thing that we've experienced, a lot of people like to space out their cows' calves. And, um, you know, like, oh, I want my cow to have a break between calving and calve, you know, every two years instead of one year and everything. And in my experience, you end up with it being harder to get the bread back. And yeah. that's what every dairy farmer here says as well. As soon as you start seeing heat, you try, you start trying to get them bread. Yeah. Because the longer you wait, the harder it gets. Mm. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's crazy how they're just designed for production mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. well I, oh it says our internet connection is unstable um i feel like we could we could continue talking for hours but um oh yeah <laughs> yeah there's so much to talk about with the with the milk cows and that's i mean like i said that's our love we i mean we really value our milk cows so um but uh, before we wrap this up, I just wanted you to be able to let people know how they can find you um, online um, and talk a little. I know you said a little bit about your membership group, but um, you and you do like quarterly membership openings. Is that right? Is that how you do that? Yes. So I do quarterly signups and it's basically an online mentoring group to all things homemade, homesteading. Whether you live in an apartment or if you live on a big farm, a homestead, um, the feedback I get is that it's applicable no matter where you live. Mm -hmm. So just on all things homemade. You can find me on YouTube, Venison for Dinner, Instagram, Facebook. Not really Facebook, but you know, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and my blog everywhere, I'm Venison for Dinner. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Thank you so much for um, taking the time away from your, your babies. I know they're there with you, but um, to be able to talk to us today and we've learned a lot and I hope that our um, listeners are, you know, thinking more and more about the family milk cow because I, I think there's so much value in it. And um, we, we're always advocating for people to, to give it a try. We don't want to be the only dairy in the county. You know, we want people to have their own. So mm -hmm. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to say that you didn't? Oh, I mean, we could probably talk all afternoon, but this has been a fun conversation. I've enjoyed talking with you guys about milk cows. Well, good. All right. Well, thank you so much. See you later. Thanks.